um, the auditory epicenter for passionate people seeking a life of freedom, choice and abundance. My name is Gabby. And my name's Goose. This is Goose. <laughs> and you did an awesome job at the intro today, Gabby. Well done. Oh. G Bizzle in the house. <laughs> <laughs> that was awful. That was fantastic. So obviously... Um, <laughs> Everyone's probably, probably a little more used to hearing my booming voice uh, ce- celebrating sh- and chaperoning the start of every episode. But I want everyone to, everyone out there in the world to know that Gabby also has a booming voice when she tries to mock me. Boom. So, boom. <laughs> so, host Gabby. Hello. What are we going to be talking about today? Passion. <laughs> <laughs> booming voices. We're talking about booming voices. We're talking about passion. So, look, it's been it's a it's a wild, wild world <laughs> out there. And um, what we have been noticing, look, we we recently did an episode on current market conditions and all of that kind of stuff. And we tend to cover quite a broad spectrum of stuff in here. But I believe, and I'm sure that you, if you're listening to this, um, you probably believe it too. And Gabby, I don't know, what do you believe? But um, <laughs> Understanding how to position yourself uh, is as important as understanding how to invest in the real estate in ter- invest investing in real estate in terms of tactics and stuff. So that's why we sort of talk. You know, we do touch it. We do hit on tactics. We do hit on market trends. We do hit on that kind of stuff at the podcast. But I would say that ninety percent of the battle is won or lost inside inside you. Ooh, intense shit. shit. We just got deep. Wow. So, what are we going to be talking about today? Because I'm actually really passionate about You mentioned passion at the start. And we're going to get yes. into passion in a second. But I'm actually really passionate about this topic for a couple of reasons. But Gabby, what are we talking about today? We're going to talk about the traits that, from our experience and our perspective, the traits that really make all successful investors successful and entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. He, 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 here's the big here's the big hook here's the here's the here's it on a bumper sticker right these are the eight traits that all successful investors and entrepreneurs have in common and that's deliberately repaired those two things together because there is a psychological propensity and risk profile and all of that kind of stuff that allows the most successful entrepreneurs and the most successful investors to excel and to, and exceed and outperform in their respective paths. And it's an interesting um, intertwining of characteristics, traits, and similarities that float between the two uh, fields, which is exactly why I thought we should talk about this today. Okay, so it's going to be, um, there's quite a lot to get through and I'm really mindful that we don't want to go for like two hours. So why don't we just get stuck into it? Because I think that this is going to be, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, maybe I'm not an entrepreneur um, because I don't have a business yet or maybe ever want to have a business, that's fine. That's fine. And maybe you're thinking, oh, but I'm not a successful investor yet. Um, so maybe this isn't for me. Well, I, I want to tell you right now that you're wrong, okay? Because the these traits are traits that you can identify in yourself and these are traits that are going to allow you to self-identify and to be able to pull yourself forward. The aim of this is not to talk about what other people have that you don't potentially. It's to help you identify what of these you do have so that you can become a more empowered, more impactful investor in your own life. And if you are an entrepreneur, you're going to see how you can transfer the skills and the, and attributes that you've developed in business into real estate and potentially vice versa. So make sure you stick around and listen to all of this because I'm certain it's going to be very impactful and it's going to help you to understand how you need to show up in the investing game and in the entrepreneur game. Okay. Awesome. Sound good? Sounds great. Awesome. Okay, Boomsy. Do you want to kick it off? Boomsy, that's me. (laughs) (laughs) Point number one, passion. Hey, Goose. Mr. Passion. Oh, God, I'm passionate. I am so passionate. 
I, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a passionate person. But look, what we're talking about here. So, like the number one characteristic that um, that entrepreneurs and, and successful investors share is passion. Now, some people might not have that deep drive. A lot of people hear me bang on about you know, or we bang on about big, hairy, audacious goals and wanting to change the world and all of that kind of stuff. It's really about what that's going to mean to you. But passion is really about having an inner drive to succeed you know you've got the kind of people who are the wallflowers the couch potatoes they're happy to let life pass them by they're happy to just coast they don't want to upset the apple cart you know things are okay let's just let's just let's just take things a little easy and a little slower i don't want anything too exciting to happen thank you but that's not probably going to be um, the kind of person who's going to be a successful entrepreneur, correct? No, it's not very congruent, I guess. It's not very congruent. Not very uh, congruent with being a successful investor either. I would, I would, I would, I would, I would put forward. Yeah, I think because of the, particularly there, there are fields that you dedi- that you dedicate yourself to. You dedicate time, and you dedicate attention, and you t- dedicate your resources, and all of the above require dedication and if there's no passion there if you're just kind of ambivalent about the process and the result then that's not it's not likely that it's suitable for you yeah so which is okay yeah that's fine many people are not that way that's all good look my parents i love my parents they're they're like i love your parents they're great hey hey pam hey ian how's it going (laughs) um I'm not sure if they've worked out how to listen to podcasts yet. I'm not yet. sure if they have listened to this yet. I'm not sure if they've worked out how to listen to podcasts yet. but We'll get them on. We'll get them onto it. Well, yeah, we'll get them on the show. They are not. They are not this. They are neither entrepreneurs nor successful investors. And that's not just by happenstance. That is by characteristic. You know, they, they are not the kind of people who have uh, an inner drive that makes them want to tear down walls and, and push forward into the future. They're quite happy to be content. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have grown up in that environment because, you know, they're amazing people and we had, we, you know, we had, you know, amazing experiences and they taught me a lot, but, you know, we couldn't be further from the truth. At this point, I just quickly want to interject in a little segue. If you're watching this uh, potentially on YouTube or via video, I just want to share with you this amazing cup. So if you can't see this, (laughs) this is my face on a mug. Gooseface Killer, that was my DJ name. And this was the first gift that Gabby gave to me when she was flirting with me um, back before we started dating. How, just, how graphic designers flirt. Yeah, this is how creative they, types flirt. They draw <laughs> faces on mugs. cups. This is me. So anyway, just moving on from that. <laughs> so you, you, need to have a, you need to have an inner drive to succeed. You've got to have something that's pulling you forward. Uh, we've talked about this a lot, so I don't want to get stuck on here, but like, you know, a passion, a purpose, a why, a reason. And that reason could just be a desire for change. You could actually just be, look, I do not want my life to be what it is right now and I need something more and better. I want to know that there is something more in the future. You don't have to go out there and say, I want to be Mother Teresa or, you know, Gandhi or anything like that. You can just want to want things to be better than they are and that's okay but you've got to be focused on an impact to some degree you know it's got your decisions have to have some weight and that you have to be trying to create impact for others for yourself and and again others doesn't mean go and start an orphanage it could mean i want to impact my family i want to know that i can spend more time with my family and i want to know that when they grow up i'm going to have something to pass on to them and this is the legacy that i want to leave or it could be, I had a call with a guy the other day who said, "Look, you know, I'm, I'm a little, you know, I'm a little nervous about sharing my goals because I know they're big, but here they are." And he wants to earn a million dollars passive income per month. This is his goal. Now he's not stupid either. He's a very intelligent guy, extremely intelligent guy. Uh, he's actually a lawyer. He works in mergers and acquisitions, but and he knows that he's not going to do that just like like by happenstance, and he's going to need to work towards it. But he's got an impact goal. Now, what we're really talking about here is the is the the energetic and emotional characteristic differences between being what I would consider to be a lion or a lamb. Mm. So, metaphorically speaking, the lamb is the kind of person that expects the things they want to be given to them. They follow. They never lead. They never leave the herd. All of that kind of stuff. And we all know. Lots of lambs. And lambs are beautiful. Everyone's, and lambs are cute. We all love lambs, right? But, but they're also not the people that go out and get what they want. 
A lion is someone who goes out and hunts the, thing, the things that he or she wants. They go and they know what they want. They see that target and they chase it down and they hunt it and they take it back. That is their prize. So my question on this point is, are you a lion or are you a lamb? Mic drop. <laughs> okay, great. Awesome. Let's just crack in. We are on to number two. Risk taking. Now, a lot of people think about risk, right? And they quite honestly, they shit themselves. Risk is a part of everyday life. There's a risk that when I buy all these exotic coffees that I buy, they might be horrible and I might waste all my money. A <laughs> <laughs> and then we have to drink horrible coffee. It doesn't for a usually of days. happen, just for clarity. So. <laughs> now, <laughs> sometimes. Um, but there's a risk whenever you cross the road. There is a risk whenever you do anything in life. There is a risk of success or failure. Now, it, it, that is literally in everything you do. There is a risk of success and there is a risk of failure i mean at the end of the day your heart fails sometimes you know like people have heart attacks even in the things that you don't necessarily control there is a risk of failure and you can live your life in fear of that or you can understand what levels of risks you're prepared to tolerate what are the upsides and what are the downsides and how are you going to propel yourself through this world Gabby, you've got a you've got a face of consternation. <laughs> Tell me what's going on in there. No, I actually just remembered being told once that pretty much the most dangerous thing you can do in in the day is to drive a car. Yeah. Like mechanically and physically the most dangerous thing you can do because yep. you're driving around in this big hunk of metal around other crazy people that are also driving hunks of metal, but nobody really gives a thought to that risk because the reward and the process and the the benefit outweighs that and nobody even thinks about it. No, exactly right, exactly right. And a lot of people don't think about the risk in so many things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, but then get caught up in, in the perceived risks of other things. Now, on, on this mm -hmm. note, you know, there's, there's two ways that you can mitigate risk, okay? Realistically, I think there's only two. There is, you can go out and gain knowledge. Now, that you can never reduce risk to zero. It's yeah. impossible. Yeah. It is impossible because even if you choose not to do something, if you're like, I'm going to reduce the risk by not doing that, you then you've just achieved 100% failure. I don't know. What are the pros and cons of me doing yoga? Okay, maybe I'll get flexible. Maybe I'll hurt my back. Uh, or maybe I won't achieve either. Like there's, there's, a, there's a myriad of things there. But if you don't do it, that's failure. And it, there's, a, there's a whole range of ways to, to, to look at that. So you can never reduce risk to zero. You can only reduce it, only mitigate it in two ways. Gain the knowledge yourself so that you can understand the parameters and play the game better or outsource that responsibility to somebody who has already done that and walked that path. We'll get to that in a moment. But what I want to talk about in this little segment is risk profiling, right? So taking calculated risks is, is one of the strongest attributes of a successful investor or a successful entrepreneur because they understand that you can't ever mitigate a risk down to zero. And in fact, for entrepreneurs and business owners, 97% of businesses fail. 97, that's a 3% success rate. 3%. Tell me, would you buy a property if you thought that that you are there was only a three percent chance you would succeed? Mm, probably not. Probably not. I, I, I honestly, I, I've been an entrepreneur and a business owner since I was seventeen, but I wouldn't. I would not go and buy a property if I thought that there was only a three percent chance of succeeding. Go figure. Now, in fact, with businesses, sixty percent fail in the first three years. So the statistical probability of someone successfully uh, building a, a business is very low. It's very low. However, going back to the first point and then also to the next few points, you know, you'll understand why that is something they continue to do anyway because the reward is very high. So with business, as people, like everyone knows people like Elon Musk, oh yeah, trillions and trillions of dollars. It's a risk-reward ratio. Mm -hmm. So with business, you have the potential to grow a business realistically as big as you want Right, there are constraints, yep. but it's pretty much as big as you want, as big as you're prepared to push it within the parameters of your skills and ability to grow in that marketplace. Right, yep. so the reward is very high, but the risk is extremely high. But what about real estate? <laughs> like real estate, like what is what is what is what do you think the chances of success in real estate are, Gabby? 
Just there's no direct answer to this. I'm just curious. I think given time, pretty close to 100%. Exactly. So t- time is the piece that people tend to forget about in this, you know, in the risk conversation, I think. Totally, totally. So, you know, the reality is you can't create a business and then go, okay, this doesn't work right now. I'll just put it on the shelf and I don't know, I'll come back in 10 years and yeah. And so it'll, it'll that'd die. Be, that'd it'll be die. Great. It'll be like a, it'll be like a plant you put in the cupboard. It'll die. Yeah, you know? we, we, we wouldn't have the world. I mean, the world's different right now, but the, the world with all the successful businesses and society operating how it does if people just put businesses on the shelf and then... No, let it doesn't it, work. Let it, grow. it doesn't work. <laughs> However, real estate has a continuous upward bias trend, right? Which means that even if you've made a mistake, and I talk to people about this all the time, right? Mm. Uh, recently, clients, a couple of clients just signed up to work with us in our buyer's agency business. If you don't know what we do, we help people to invest in real estate. If you want help, reach out. We're more than happy to have a conversation. But they actually just signed up to work with us. They're awesome people. And I was having a look at their portfolio with them last night. And they bought a property 12 years ago and it's only increased in value by $60,000. 12 years. 12 years, $60,000. Hmm. You can do the maths on that at home. We've got too much to get through, but that is not very good in terms of growth rate. However, however, and I speak to a lot of people um, that have invested in loads of different places and had what would ostensibly be seen as um, a failure. Oh, it's gone down in value or things have changed or whatever. What should I do? And I always say, unless it, unless it is stopping you from being able to move forward, unless there is a reason that you can't borrow, can't do it, unless you get rid of it, just give it time. Just give it time. There is, there is basically a 100% success rate in real estate, given enough time. So then it really, it's about, okay, well, that's all well and good, but maybe I don't want to live for a thousand years to, to wrestle with my mistakes. So how do you mitigate that risk and what is a reasonable risk profile when you're looking at a property? You know, based on the information at hand, you know, is it greater than 50%? Is it like, am I more likely to succeed than failure? Is that a, is that a good measure? What do you think? Uh, again, I don't have the answers here. Generally, yet. yes. Yeah. Generally, that's the classic pros and cons list. Totally. St- statistical yeah. probability would say, is there a greater than 50% chance that I'm going to succeed in this venture in the short to medium term? And if the answer is yes, well, then statistically, you should probably just do it, especially when you consider that you've got a 100% chance of success given time. Like it, it's all, and I don't, I'm not trying to like, you know, spruik and pro, pro, like, you know, just tell everyone that it's a magic cure. But this, this is the reality. As long as, you're, as long as you're buying in, you know, a reasonably good area with, you know, and you've got, you understand the fundamentals and you mitigated some risk through knowledge or through outsourcing, you're going to be just fine. And you've just got to get in there and do it. You've got to understand what that risk profile is. Now, I, I, I also deal with people who they, their risk profile is so small that they're like, unless they are 90%, 99% certain that this is going to be the one they don't make a decision and, and guess what they still haven't made a decision these are the people who are losing literally tens of thousands of dollars in opportunity cost and I don't say that lightly but if you look at opportunity cost in a rising market or a growing market of how much growth you're missing out on on a per month basis by waiting on the sidelines waiting for the one as opposed to taking a calculated risk based on the information you have at hand, looking at the numbers and going, okay, is this more likely or less likely to move me closer towards my goals or not? And does it fit within the goal structure and parameters that I want to achieve things? Then just get stuck into it. Makes sense. Yes, we should move on. We should move on. I know we're (laughs) running out of time. Okay. Well, I hope that helps someone out there anyway to wake up. So number three, flexibility. Mm. Over to you, Gabby. I keep rambling. <laughs> You're very good at rambling. Um, so this, c- coming back off the, the risk taking, the risk profile, it's it's being able to assess all, all the things that are happening, all of your options and being nimble in your, in your tactics and being nimble in your strategies, but making sure that they're rooted in the principles that you follow as a, as a business owner or as an investor and knowing the principles and you know holding on to those and being rock solid in 
how you operate, but then having the flexibility in changing your behaviors and your decisions in that moment. Absolutely. This is basically principles-based thinking as opposed to um, tactics-based thinking. Yeah. So tactics-based thinking would be something like, hey, we're the renovate for profit guys. And all you need to do is just go and renovate for profit. Yep. And that's all you need to do to win the game. Renovating for profit is a tactic. And it can work for the right type of person, the right kind of environment, the right kind of strategy with the right, 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 right a whole bunch of stuff. But it's not necessarily for you. And, so, and this goes into business as well as into real estate investing. So principles-based thinking is what's going to allow you to be adept and adroit and, and to really be nimble and, and overcome any kind of fluctuations, market variances, challenges, obstacles that you're going to face. Now, the greatest and most successful entrepreneurs are not people who you know sat down and wrote out a nice business plan and went, oh, all I'm going to do is do this and then this and then this and then this and then I have success because nothing is ever linear. You know, the most successful people in the world are the ones that can come across an obstacle and like a river, flow around it and keep on racing, building up mm-hmm. momentum as they go. They are not the people who get stuck in the dam, right? And this is, and this is a massive difference in the way that people think. You need to be able to go, okay, what are the many, many movements that I could make now or in the future to ensure that this is going to be a success? And also, if it completely fails, am I going to be okay? Hmm. I think about that a lot. You know, part of my decision-making profile, and I may be higher risk than you, certainly higher risk than Gabby, which is probably why we're at good balance. I like to think about things. I'm like, am I going to die? If all of this fails, will I die or will I be okay? <laughs> it might sound really base, but it's like, okay, well, I know that if I'm alive, I can still participate. I can move on. I can overcome. I can... <laughs> You know, I, there's nothing that can really stop me as long as I'm alive, right? So for me, I'm probably got a bit of a higher risk profile, I guess. Um, interestingly, that's when it comes to me. And very interestingly, my risk profile is pretty, sm- pretty small when I'm helping other people. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really funny thing. But, um, but that's for me anyway. So I think really about this, it's about understanding that, that you need to you need to have flexibility in your decision making protocols. You need to be able to go, okay, I've explored this train of thought, I've explored this idea, and it doesn't seem to be giving me the fluidity that I want or need right now. Is this what I still want to do? Or should I should I roll with the punches? Should I move and shake and allow myself to continue to move forward? In my journey. Yeah, I think we're seeing this a lot, particularly at the moment. That um, when when there's major like macroeconomic changes in the world, a lot of people raise questions about tactics and like, oh, what do I what do I do now? This thing that I was doing isn't probably going to work. But then you see others that are really opportunistic and go, this is amazing. There's so much opportunity coming up because they're rooting it in the in the principles of how they operate and not like you said, a renovate for profit type of tactic um, and just thinking, well, that might not work now. I'm, I'm done for because it doesn't work. And, totally. Yeah. I, totally. I recently had a client that came and said to me, Goose, I won't buy unless it's 10% under market value. And I said, sorry. Sorry, what? I said, I won't buy unless it's 10% under market value. I said, okay, well, we might have some issues. <laughs> Because you can absolutely do that, but then what you're going to be doing is you need to understand how that's going to compromise your future journey. In a, in a rising market, you need to look at what's moving ahead, yeah. not, what, not what's in stasis. Okay, so under market value is a tactic. Renovate for profit is a tactic. Subdivision is a tactic. Granny flats are a tactic. Boarding house conversions are a tactic. All of these things are tactics. You know, and understanding that, that how to deploy, think about them like arrows in a quiver. And knowing which arrow to unsheath at the right time to hit the right target in the right environment is the most important thing. It's knowing how to use the tools in your arsenal, I think, is the most important thing rather than just randomly hoping that, that you know, whatever you do is going to work. Yep. This flows nicely into the next point, which number four is resilience, um, which is basically the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. So, yeah. Particularly, Toughness. yeah. It's, it's generally toughness, um, particularly when markets shift and, you know, it's a new environment that you haven't experienced before. It's about 
building that thick skin and that strategy and those principles so that you can bounce back if anything goes wrong or you know it's just a new environment that you're not used to and you don't have the experience in exactly elasticity Mm. you know there's a difference between being hard and strong my dad taught me this at a very young age you know a brick is hard but it is brittle however leather is flexible but it is strong right and and that's kind of and and it's tough right Mm. And, and i think that that's how you need to think about it being hard will cause you to break a window is hard but it will break but being tough and being strong part of that characteristic is having flexibility is a is having movement that's what makes it strong that's what makes kevlar strong and that's bulletproof it's the fact that it is a bunch of interwoven and interlaced fibers that move and absorb they're not it's not a rock hard shield that shatters when it gets hit and this is the difference this is resilience this is how you actually genuinely need to consider yourself like psychological resilience is the ability to to cope with a crisis uh, and also then to return to a pre-crisis status pretty quickly now we all want to avoid crises no one wants to be in a crisis and what is a crisis a crisis doesn't necessarily need to be a hostage scenario a crisis could be oh my god there's no coffee this morning what the heck <laughs> And it's about how you recover. We always have coffee. It's okay. So I always make sure we avoid that crisis. But that being said, that being said, it, you know, it's about understanding, okay, how can, I, how can I overcome the challenges that I face on a day-to-day basis, small, medium, large, and everything in between. And it really exists when you, you promote the, your own ability to... Focus on a long-term goal and about to move towards that. You know, it's really about protecting yourself from the from the negative effects of stress by understanding that. Well, I mean, ultimately, to go a little bit zen, that there is nothing to stress about. None of us exist anyway, and it's all just a big. You know, it's all just part of a construct in your own mind. But the reality is, nothing really matters anyway. Okay, so the sooner that you can understand how to mitigate your stress see the opportunity for it is, be flexible and move in that continuous direction, the more resilient you're going to be. And ultimately, the more resilient you are, the happier you are. This is, a, this is an amazing correlation. The more that you can see stress, look it in the face and go, yeah, okay, all right, let's have it and let's just move right along. That was wonderful. Thank you for that experience. Have a joyous existence. Goodbye. That is good, what's going to allow you to operate in a, a much happier state. You, I'm sure that you maybe have some of these characteristics or maybe you know people who do. The people that get freaked out, stressed out, wound up, overworked at the smallest possible things. Oh my God, the cashier at that register, they, they, they told me this thing and then this other thing happened and oh my God, it was horrible. It's like, oh, guys, hey, let's move on. Crises come in all shapes and sizes. It's about how you deal with it. Oh my God, I'm never going to have toilet paper again. <laughs> I better take it all. Oh my I God! Better, I better take all of the toilet paper. Oh my God, quick, everyone got the toilet paper. Oh my God. That's a crisis. <laughs> so this is the kind of thing, like when you actually uh, have resilience, that's a great example, right? There's people that are freaked out and stressed out about that. There's people that are freaked out and stressed out enough to actually fight other people in a supermarket about it. Right? That's There's been bad. people getting knife, like getting knives pulled. There's people getting tased. There's people getting in brawls, right? So there's that kind of people who are, who are clearly not resilient. They are freaking out. Then you've got the kind of people who are freaking out about the people that are freaking out. Mm. Oh, my God, I can't believe there's all these people going to taking all the toilet paper. What idiots. And they're getting super wound up about that. And then you've got the kind of people going, yeah, well, I've got a shower. She'll be right. <laughs> yeah, I think with that, that's an empathy piece and that's part of resilience is you, some people can see the situation and, and, and empathize with the whole picture and everyone that's going through this experience and then other people just go, well, I got to poop, so I'm going to take all the toilet paper for me and not really think about the big picture regardless of whether the stories that they hear are true or not it's it's an empathy piece regardless of whether they've got a shower or not (laughs) 
Anyway. <laughs> anyway, moving moving right along. Resilience. So we've covered four key characteristics. We've got four more to go. And we're going to be quick because I've got a gym date you with my PT. You do have a gym date. So uh, number five, self-confidence. Mm. Otherwise known as the knowing. The knowing. Really that to me comes down to an abundance mindset. So what I mean by that is... You know, self-confidence does not mean arrogance and it does not mean uh, walking around trying to tell everyone how good you are, but it is the confidence to know that you have within yourself the ability to overcome and succeed. Mm -hmm. It's the idea that despite whatever challenges you may face, despite the uh, rigmaroles that you may experience or, you know, the trials and tribulations that you may need to overcome, that there is opportunity everywhere and it is abundant the world is abundant. And that creates a calmness and a knowing that as long as you can stay the course and as long as you can continue to play the game and as long as you do not lose focus, lose heart, and lose your passion and your drive, that you will be just fine. And you will find success in a perfect measure to your ability to retain the confidence within yourself. Once you start to... And everyone does have confidence that wavers. My confidence wavers frequently because... You know, I'm an emotional person. But it's your ability to, to lean back into that environment and go, you know what, I know I've got this and I'm going to be okay. We just need to keep moving forward and staying the course. Yeah, this for me is faith, right? This is faith. And I, I, I hesitate using the word faith because I think it's been tainted, I think. <laughs> I'm not a religious person myself, but, you know, a lot of people do associate the word faith with various religions um and kind of think of it in a negative way but it is general faith that everything will work out it's a faith in your own abilities and your own um it is just general self-confidence that you can figure out whatever may come your way um this i i feel like I feel like I've got a lot of faith in what we're doing and our principles and how I live my life. Like we live our life pretty, pretty bloody dedicated to just helping other people. And I think if you've got that kind of faith in bigger picture strategy and knowing who you are, that self-confidence in who you are, then you can figure out whatever, whatever comes your way. And it's, it's a very, it's a very calming like current undercurrent that runs through us where there's just a knowing that we're doing things right and we'll get through whatever we whatever we need to get through that brought the energy down (laughs) (laughs) faith did that make sense no that definitely makes sense that that definitely makes sense you know it is about it is about having a belief self-belief you know that that what you're doing is worth it yeah, and I, even yeah. if it doesn't work, it's worth it. That's that's what's going to keep you moving forward. Yeah, because you know that you're going to learn and grow. I think it's that there's that trait in people. There's there's different kinds of people where there's some people that you feel really calm being around, and they've just got a general confidence. It's not a cockiness, but it's just a, they've got self belief and a faith, and they don't get too stressed about unnecessary things that other people might get stressed about. But then you know other people that perhaps lack that self-confidence or knowing and they're quite chaotic they're freaking out (laughs) very chaotic energy freaking out they're freaking out second guessing themselves all the time rather than just getting on with it and getting stuff done and this is this is this is what self-confidence comes down to it's like okay if i just get it done if i just like okay i have enough faith i I know that there's a higher than 50 percent chance that what i'm doing is good (laughs) in some way shape or form and they're off Therefore, I will continue to continue to pursue. Right, number six, management skills. Hmm. Elaborate. Okay, I will <laughs> elaborate. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that prompt. So, management <laughs> skills really is uh, about understanding that you can't go it alone. Yes. No one who was ever successful in anything in life did it completely by themselves. There's no such thing as an overnight success. And there's no such thing as somebody who just did it completely in a silo. That can come from many reasons. A, we all probably got brought up by parents or some kind of environment, good, bad, or otherwise, that shaped our existence and shaped who we are today, right? So you can't, you can't exist in a silo. So you need to understand that. But then also moving on from 
your environmental influences. It's also about actually pragmatically and proactively building a team. You know, Elon Musk, we talk about him a little bit. He would not, he, he doesn't know how to build rockets, right? He doesn't know how to build cars. But guess what? He's got SpaceX, he's got Tesla, you know, because he knows how to build a team and he knows how to you leverage the skills of other people to move into where he, towards where he wants to go. And it's not just Elon Musk. This goes for, for many, many, many things in your life. We do it all the time. You know, we have built, we've got a very principles-based approach to what we do, but we still outsource stuff. Mm. We still build a team, both in-house and out of house, so outsourcing, to help us help other people. And if we tried to do it all of ourselves, and if we were like, oh, but, 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 but we need to do it all, we just wouldn't be able to help as many people. Mm. Okay, so then that would be compromising our bigger vision. Now, and this is, I think, what, what anyone can apply. You know, there's, great, there's a great book out there called 4-Hour Workweek so you can actually explore the, um, the joys of outsourcing even if you work in a job, a J-O-B, you're just over broke. So this can apply to anyone. Now, outsourcing doesn't necessarily mean um, get someone from the Philippines who can answer your phone because a lot of people think about virtual assistants and stuff like that. Um, outsourcing can be any time you pay somebody else to do a service that is going to free up your time, energy, or effort to be better applied in any other way. So people people outsource their property decision making process to us. Awesome, that's one example. Um, we actually we actually get meals delivered. We actually decided, you know what, our time and energy is better um, better better positioned to be serving people. And we thought, you know what, let's just take some of the time out of our day by getting some of our meals delivered. So we've outsourced a certain amount of our meals per week, they're delicious by the way, uh, to get delivered. So that we, it removes that decision-making process, it removes some of the time consideration and allows us to focus on what we do best. We love cooking, but we just, we just, it wasn't the right value equation for us. Sometimes outsourcing can be getting a tutor. Um, to help you with a help you to learn something faster. It's really about building the team mm. so you can leverage the skills of other people to move you to where you want to go faster. And basically, ditching the arrogance or the or the fear and that makes you think that you need to do it all alone. I think if we bring that back to property investing as well, great. A lot of people, I think particularly in Australia, there's a, there's this beautiful imagery of buy a shit box and want to renovate it and put on put on your overalls and whip out a paintbrush or a hammer and yep. we speak with a lot of people they're like oh I'd, I'd, I'd prefer something that you know it's run down it's within 2k's of the cbd and i'm gonna go down and i'm gonna live in it and i'm gonna renovate it and it's gonna be this beautiful dream experience yeah because they've watched the block right <laughs> probably um and then you, you pretty quickly go, okay, well, do you, ha- do you have experience doing that? Is that the highest and best use of your time? And most people go, oh, well, no. Um, and I think it's, 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 this is what, how I see management skills come in. It's because you, you may well want the result. There may be a very good result in doing a renovation in a particular property. Or it's the same with if you do a subdivision or some kind of small development. You're not necessarily going to go out and do the DA process yourself if you're if that's not the highest and best use of your time so these management skills in my opinion this is how they come in in property because it's you need to know how to draw the line on where the highest and best use of your time is and accept that you can't possibly control the micro of every little detail that happens in this journey Particularly as you get bigger, there's more, it, there's added complexity. Like we go through this quite a lot. We're very, we're very particular. We've got very high standards in what we do. Very high and standards. And we have to go through processes with, with people on our team and with people that we work with and with our clients of, we can't control every single detail. So we need to outsource to people that we trust uh, and people that just understand what we're trying to do and have, again, have that faith that, those people are going to actually deliver a better result than I could do if I went out there and I tried to render this <laughs> this old brick house that I have no skills in rendering. Totally. That, yeah. That's where management comes into it because outsource, yeah. outsourcing is just one piece. You can outsource, um, what is it? You can outsource 
jobs, but you can't outsource responsibility. Yes. So this is where the management piece comes in. You can never outsource responsibility. You can ask somebody else to do something and if they don't do it the way you want it or you don't get the result you want, it is 100% your fault and there is nothing you can do to change that. You cannot outsource responsibility. This is why it's important to manage. Manage does not mean micromanage. Manage means understanding the key metrics that you need to, to, to know at any given point in time to be able to understand the health and efficacy of the project that is being undertaken by anyone. You're not always going to succeed in what you want. You're never always going to find the right people to outsource to. But it's understanding how to manage that to make sure you get the best result is that's the key. That's the key in this, I think. Definitely. Okay, number seven. Financial management skills. You don't need to be an accountant. <laughs> true. It's true. I laugh. I laugh because I feel like there's a lot of people that have a fear about finances and money management in general um and they think that i don't understand the numbers so i can't do this and it's to a degree you do definitely need to understand it i think it's a vocabulary piece Mm. i think it's understanding more about the the lingo and the basics of how the whole picture moves together but you don't you're right you don't need to be an accountant you don't need to go and study it you don't need to no, but you need to have some. To you do need complex to have like spreadsheets or totally. But you do need to have some financial management skills, yes. right? You need to be able to understand uh, how to use money. Really, that's how it is. How to play the game of money and how to play the game of of numbers. Mm-hmm. Right? And this comes back into managing risk and a range of other things. You need to understand leverage. You need to understand debt. You need to understand how to make money work for you. This is the key. Mm-hmm. Right, you can outsource the responsibility of some parts of it to an accountant um, and to other professionals as well to help give you guidance and advice. But you need to understand how to manage that. You know, on a on a on a micro level, you need to understand how to save. You need to understand how to operate your life with a profit and loss statement. You know, like run a budget and make sure you you need to be able to forecast and go, okay, what happens if I do this? Understand the repercussions of your actions. You need to understand basic money management, and you've got to understand, okay, what like. If I spend all my money this week, what's the effect of that next week? And you can blow that up to a very macro scale and go, okay, if I invest all of my money in Project A, for example, if I've got a $700,000 um, budget for a property, should I buy one, uh, one $600,000 house or two $350,000 houses and be able to go, okay, well, what's going to make my money go further? What's better for my risk profile? I'm not saying which one's better. I mean, I know, but... You know, understanding for yourself, okay, how much headroom do I need? How much, uh, what kind of a buffer do I have? Uh, what needs to be done? And understand how to get your money to move, move you in the right way is really the key. And I think that's the key to financial management. It's not about becoming an accountant. It's just about understanding the essence and the psychology of money. We're actually going to do an episode uh, with a friend of ours on the psychology of money to help with that specific thing. So... Final point, number eight. Grit. Grit. I love grit. Grit. I love grit. So grit, along with resilience, I believe, are the two key characteristics of success in any field, I believe. Um, Many, many, many other things play into it, including health, wellness, all of that kind of stuff. We'll dig more into that in a few other episodes. But grit really is passion and perseverance for long-term and meaningful goals, right? So with this is this really lends into massively into property investing. You know, you're playing a long game, not a short game. You're swinging a long sword, a broad sword. You're not, you're not playing with a dagger. So you really need to understand how to play the long game for longevity. And it's the ability to really persist in something you feel passionate about and, and persist and persevere when you face obstacles. It's not about emotion or it's not about infatuation. It's not about hopping between different ideas and going, oh, what about this? Oh, what about that? Oh, what about this? Grit is really the ability to grit your teeth and stay the course despite the turbulence that might, might come around you. So it obviously does have similarities to, to resilience, but whereas resilience is about toughness, grit is about stayingness. And I think grit is the mental characteristic that is going to allow people to play a much bigger game. Because if you're thinking, how do I make property profit or how do I get rich in the next five years? I can guarantee you're going to lose the game to mm. someone who's, who is going, okay, I could probably make that much in five years. That's fine. But how am I going to make 
10 times that in the next 15. And I actually see this quite a lot with people who are like, you know, a lot of people want to invest in property because they want to replace their income. And it's like, yeah, okay, that's cool. So then they're like, great, I need to invest for cash flow, right? No, you need to invest for growth. And that seems counterintuitive because people who don't have the grit and tenacity to understand that actually what you need to do now needs to have on-flow effects later on, don't, they're not playing a long enough game. So for example, in that scenario, you need to build up equity and then transfer that into higher cash flow assets where you're going to get much better returns in the long term. But that's a later stage strategy, not an early stage strategy. Cash flow is there to service the debt in the early stages. It's not there to replace your income. But it's understanding how to, how to play that long game. Is, it, that really comes down to grit. And that, that applies in both business and in real estate. Yeah, it's a maturity piece. It's understanding that, you know, the, pa- the pain you might be going through today or the discomfort or whatever you're going through today, if you want the result, you need to love the process that you're going through and you need to just knuckle down and keep going. Despite the fact that you might not, you might not get dopamine hits along the way. You might not get shiny new objects and, you know, amazing results really quickly but that's not the point it's the maturity to know that you're you know if you followed all the other steps knowing that you're on the right path and not not breaking basically not giving up because you're not receiving a short-term reward i think that's great actually you could probably sum up like grit grit is the ability to continue to do tasks without receiving dopamine hits that's pretty. That's a really good way of putting it. You know, everyone, everyone's looking for these dopamine hits, these whacks of like, oh, I did a good job. Oh, bam. Oh, I feel happy. Oh, look at that. Oh, someone gave me a like on Facebook. Oh, oh. And all these things that keep driving people along the way. Grit is really the ability to continue to relentlessly pursue your goals even when you don't get any dopamine hits. I think that's great. It's a great way to sum that up, I think. Really good point. Well done. In summary, get off social media. <laughs> <laughs> People are actually shocked when I tell them I don't like social media because I'm I quite know. on there quite a lot. I, I actually don't like social media. I think it's um, I think it's uh, induces anxiety, causes a lot of narcissism. Uh, it's a pretty dangerous place. I mean, I, I like it for the connectivity, and I like it because it helps me to to impactfully share with other people. Yeah. But um, I think the people do get a little bit too caught up in the dopamine hits you know what? i think it actually i think it corrodes grit it's a very good point because i was just thinking the the times when i try and avoid social media are the times when i feel the most steady gritty yeah and it's as soon as you as soon as you start getting involved again and because everyone gets caught up in the I got three likes and then that's the dopamine hit and then you're like, oh, I'm going to do it again and then you kind of lose sight of everything else mm. you're doing with your life. Mm-hmm. There you go. There you go. Anyway, <laughs> so this has been a long one. Um, so let's wrap it up there. But look, if you want to understand uh, a little bit more about how you can develop some of these characteristics in your own life and how to apply um, entrepreneurial thinking to your own property journey, then I suggest you check out our new book, Limitless, The Renegade's Guide to Building Wealth Through Property. You can get that at renegadespropertybook.com. That's renegadespropertybook.com. So grab a copy there. Let us know what you think. And of course, if you enjoyed this episode and other episodes, please do uh, give us some feedback. We love hearing from people. And also, if you've got requests of stuff you'd love for us to cover, we want to serve. We're really here to help people and move people through in their property journey. So let us know what's going to serve you the most. And as always, stay positive, stay passionate, stay powerful. <laughs> we'll see you on the inside.